All righty. Hey, everybody. Uh, okay. Well, okay. We're live. All right. Hey, everybody. Welcome to our third presentation of the day here uh, for the RSN Spring Conferences. My name is Francis O'Rourke. I'm your host. Um, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, up now, we've got our next presentation. I think if if we can see her behind that book. Jamie, are you there? Are you oh, still? Oh, my God. Oh, sorry. You weren't supposed to say that. I'm sorry. I thought I thought you knew we were going live. Okay. Well. Oh, okay. No. I'll have to delete this from the internet. That's fine. <laughs> it won't be the first time I've deleted something that uh, something uh, something bad that happened on a first channel. But anyway, um, so Jamie, thank you so much for joining us. Jamie, why don't you introduce yourself to everybody who's watching and tell us uh, what you do at first and uh, and what your role is. Sure. Sure. Well, first of all, thank you for having me, and I really appreciate what you're doing here, and we all do at, at first headquarters. You know, it's a tough time for all of us. It's really, it's been obviously challenging for everybody in our community. And we've been overwhelmed with the positive energy that's come out of all of the kind of offshoots that's happened without our season going on as planned. So I'm, I'm Jamie Luce. I'm the team advocate for FIRST Robotics Competition. Uh, and the reason I'm here today is because I am the lead for the 2020 game design team. And as team advocate, I have a, kind of a number of responsibilities, and we don't really need to go into like all the little details of things I do. But basically, um, beyond being the game design lead, I also do all of the digital marketing that comes out of First Robotics Competition. So that's everything on the, on the web that's FRC related. That's the blog. That's the team updates. That's the blast. That's the Twitter and Facebook and kind of all the communication systems that come out of first robotics competition, um, go through me and I work on crafting them and getting, you know, making that message work. Um, I'm also the representative for a lot of the other, depart other departments to first robotics competition. So marketing and education and, um, development and diversity and inclusion. Um, wow. I work with all those groups to make sure that the message that they send, it works with our teams and, and has the right, you know concepts and and is related to frc so so are yeah, you so saying are you, <laughs> are you saying that that there's more to first than just frc <laughs> there is in fact and and not to be like go goofy about it but but um we do a lot of work i do a lot of work with people outside frc so, so Very yeah cool. we have a lot yeah. all right well hey jamie thank you so much for joining us and sure. today today we're going to be talking you know we can talk a little bit about your role as team advocate but what we're really here to talk about is um your role as the game design lead for uh, the 2020 game um, yeah. and all that fun stuff. We're going to get into that in just a quick second, but I want to say sure. a couple uh, words first. Um, so Jamie is is our guest here on the show, and I just want to say to remember everybody that this session is about the first game design process and infinite recharge. And um, you know, I'm sure Jamie would say that when we have more information about what's going on with 2020, 2021, next year's game, whatever was in that book, uh, we'll be first. We'll be happy to post that on their website and through their channels right. of communication. Yeah, and I really I, I appreciate that so much, Francis, because we want to focus this conversation on on game design because we could have a, another whole session or probably like two or three days on <laughs> the, all those other things. Yeah. But um, we're going to focus today on game design. So appreciate that, and and hope the community and their questions in the chat will kind of focus around that. Cool. All right, and. Yeah. Last, before we get to your, your slides here and sure. start talking, I want to say thank you to um, uh, so the people that helped to make this possible. I want to thank WPI, otherwise known as Worcester Polytechnic Institute. Uh, they're a leader in project-based education and is the and ha was the first university to offer a BS, a bachelor's, a master's, and a PhD in robotics engineering. So if you want to learn more about becoming a student at WPI or sponsoring one of their great projects, visit WPI.edu. So, uh, with that said, awesome. uh, last but not least, I, I have to say I have to oh. tell you a short story about WPI. Every, uh -oh. I, I'm sure everyone knows I'm from New England, so this is my you know WPI is definitely my home turf. It was always my team's favorite venue. Oh. Um, love going there, um, and so I, I coach a team in Maine. I still coach a team in Maine, um, and I I remember we were at WPI when they made one of the first announcements about that robotics engineering. Mm -hmm. Uh, course and it was so exciting yep. my students were uh, just beside themselves about the opportunity to study 
something that they were really passionate about at a place that they that they truly enjoyed. So so wow. exciting. That's that's a great story, Jamie. Yeah. And yeah. and our, the RB just uh, celebrated its 10 year anniversary as well. So I'm sure that that was not 10 years ago. Definitely. I definitely remember that too. And I'm definitely not that old either. So it's um, hard to imagine <laughs> that that was 10 years ago. Yes. All right. Um, so Jamie, um, whenever you're ready, uh, we'll be happy to, to, to have you sort of start talking about, um, about the sure. game. So I just want to, I, I want to, I talk a lot in case anyone hasn't figured it out in the last just 10 minutes. Um, so anytime Francis, you want to interrupt with a question or a comment or, you know, um, your, kind of your own involvement in how you interact with the game in different ways. If there are questions from the chat, you want to stop, just go ahead and do it. This does not need to be a, you know, one person talking and, and everyone listening. Yeah. Um, it'll be much more interesting if we just interact with each other. So I do have some slides prepared, surprise. Um, and I, I really wasn't going to, I was just going to talk. And then, um, uh, you know, I had some conversation with some people at work and they were like, man, maybe it'll be a little bit better if you just had something to back you up. So yeah. Um, we're going to start with uh, where we always start with game design, and that is what are what we usually call our sacred cows. But I don't have any pictures of cows, and <laughs> I figured I would share something from my own personal life. So I decided on this very delicious and lovely tomato hornworm who <laughs> wreaks havoc in my garden. So these are our sacred worms. When we when we first start talking about games. We really do have some important guardrails that we try to put up to say, what, where can we go? Kind of what's the space we're going to work in? And, and the reason that the first one on here is so big is because it truly is the number one thing that we, talk, we, that we think about whenever we think about anything with game design, and that is that this experience has to be safe. So lots of people, you know, they'll say things like, you know, let's, when you think about, for example, those of you that have been around a while, and I'll try not to do this because I, it, I get very frustrated when it happens to me. Um, but when we played the game co that we called Ultimate Ascent, where teams had to shoot the Frisbees, um, a lot of those Frisbees were going really fast. Yes. And so when we, when you think about that game and all the pieces that came into it, you know, there's a reason there was uh, nets around the field. Because if those frisbees, and some of them did leave the field, but when those frisbees left the field, they were they could do some pretty significant damage to our audience. And so that's that is you know number one question that we think about: Is this game safe? Is it safe for our students? Is it safe for our refs? Is it safe for our volunteers? Is it safe for our audience? Um, it, you know, is it safe to play in venues on basketball courts? Right, right. like those are expensive to build. They're expensive to maintain. Um, so safety is really our, our number one concern when we think about game design. Yeah, and actually, and, just to, to sort of break in real quick, I was at uh, yeah. I was at week zero in 2013, which was the <laughs> the only time that that teams were allowed to just throw frisbees willy nilly, uh, yeah. and there were a lot of frisbees all over the everywhere. Um, also, yeah. also we have a, a question from uh, sure crispy kiwi. They're saying, uh, is a water game safe? Oh, that's such a good question, <laughs> and. and <laughs> And, and we don't want to like go down the water yes, game yes. too, too deep, but I will say I get, you know, I'm out in the field every weekend at an event during the event season. And I try to interact with when I'm at events, I don't, I'm not an FTA. I, I'm not a, an, or a assigned volunteer. I will, what I like to do at events is get out into the pits, get out into the stands and talk to folks who are not either field side or in, you know, kind of closely involved with the field. Because we have lots of ways that we get feedback from people on the field. But it's difficult for us to get feedback from people that kind of aren't on the field. So I try to right. get out on the field. And the most, obviously, the most common question I get is, when are we going to play a water game? <laughs> and and I, and I love the creativity because, uh, you know, the, I know it's in some ways it's kind of like a huge joke and everyone sort of knows in the back of their mind that we're never going to play a water game. But are we really, can we really say that, you know, like the future is unknown. We are, we, as a game design team, we try to be as creative as possible at all times. And, you know, nothing really is off the table other than kind of these guardrail pieces that I'm talking about now. So you know, I tr I do try to challenge students. Like, where would you practice? Like, where would you host an event? A bathtub? Like, I, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> so it's like that. You know, there are things that you have to think about when you go down that path. So, 
obviously safety is number one. Um, we do really try, I know some people don't believe this, but we do really try to build games that are easy to understand at a high level. So that when you walk in, essentially, you've never heard of first before, you've never seen a robotics competition before, you walk in, you can kind of watch for a couple seconds and be like, oh, I get it. They're like shooting those balls in that goal. Good. Good enough for me, right? I can sit down and enjoy this idea. Now, obviously, our games are nuanced to like the nth degree because we have an amazing community of really creative thinkers. And we really want to challenge you. And we really want to see what you can come back with. But we also need, need to have the game be kind of just like in general to the normal kind of or typical person that's going to walk in something that they can understand. Right. Yeah. And is, um, that, is that why is that kind of why you guys have moved into using like themes in the last like four or five years more? Yeah, you know, it's it's really interesting, this, like, um, development process that we have with the themes. I will say, I started working at first in June of 2015, and so it was right at the end of Recycle Rush, and we were just going into Stronghold, and that was kind of the first time that we built this, I mean... Lots of people will say that like Lunacy had a theme, which undoubtedly it, it sort of had a nice wrapping, yeah. but it didn't really have a, the story the way that we did starting in Stronghold. So Stronghold was really the first time that we dealt with that theme concept. And we worked really closely with the folks at Disney, as everyone knows, for Stronghold. And we learned a lot of really important lessons about how you create uh, a, a true um experience that's really encompassing right by building this story that you tell outside now lots of people aren't theme people and i totally respect that because you the best part about frc is you can be involved with frc without being a theme person awesome like come build your robot to take part in it it's so great but for those of us who are theme people and i will say i'm a theme person i am as well I, when, when we come into this game design process, having that storyline really helps us answer a lot of questions when we go down that path. So you say, why are you going to shoot these balls in the goal? Well, ultimately, the story of Infinite Recharge is that we wanted to protect First City from these asteroids that were coming in. So you shoot the balls in the goal because you want to build up the strength of your shield generator. And that, for me, helps me go down those roads of how you bring in the artwork and the pit you know the outside experiences and the downloadable content and yep. kind of all those other pieces so and i don't want to like stick to these slides if we don't need to but one of the things i do want to point out is that we do try to think about games that are relatable across cultures okay. because lots of people in in um you know when you're when you're in your own inside your own culture you think like this is a great story or this is a great experience and then when you kind of take those themes or those ideas outside of your own culture you find out that that really doesn't translate well into the many 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 cultures that we have involved in frc which we're growing really quickly internationally which is so exciting yeah but that means that we need to really be welcoming to those cultures and not set up these elaborate stories that only folks from a certain cross culture of of our world would understand. So that's something that we we're really trying to work more and more toward is that relatable across cultures. And and not to uh, you don't have to necessarily answer this one, um, mm. but can you give an example of of an idea maybe that doesn't fit that example because as challenging as it is to to design for this, it's equally as challenging for many people to think outside their own culture, right? <laughs> well, one of the things actually, when we were talking about um, Infinite Recharge, when we were kind of starting this storytelling experience with Disney, one of the things that we that is very popular in the Star Wars films is this concept of the role that Han Solo plays, ah. which is a smuggler, right? But that concept of that, like, kind of pirate, like, smuggler space doesn't, that story doesn't tell well in all cultures. True. That's true. So that's a really good example of something just in this past season that we dealt with when we were trying to pull in those Star Wars themes um, across, kind of across the story development. Okay, great. So that's one thing that we, you know, that's one thing that's an example Another thing, um, so one one story that we love to tell is in Destination Deep Space, which was the the story with the rockets trying to get the rockets off the planet, um, is that the two the cargo ship originally was supposed to be two rockets lying flat. That as you filled them up, they lifted up so that they would become vertical. Like physically? 
Yes, like physically, like lift up off the floor. The whole rocket? Yeah, yeah. Damn. Totally a cool idea. Yeah. <laughs> However, the visualness of a rocket, like lifting up for takeoff, was probably would it have told as well of a story around our planet as the as having a cargo ship on the field. Oh, so okay. that's another example sure. of you know something where we have to think about you know the whole message in terms of the of our culture. So obviously we really want to treat our volunteers amazing because we couldn't we could not run first robotics competition. We couldn't run first at all without our without our volunteers. We have about a thousand volunteers for every employee. So when we make a decision, we really need to make sure that our volunteer crew is taken care of. So that's something that we that is a big guardrail for us. Now a lot of people come back and say, "What were you thinking in 2016 yep. in Stronghold with those defenses?" And you're right, it was tough. That was a tough year on volunteers. And in fact, uh, Steamworks was not much better. There were a lot of of those fuel on the yeah. field, and it was a lot of work to to clean them up. Um, but you know, we take it into consideration. So that's and and we felt like we did the best we could with what we were with where we wanted to go. And and to inject my own kind of uh, thoughts sure. onto this, right? As as a volunteer who volunteers a lot, most truthfully, most years in first field reset is a job that is challenging. Just there yeah. are some years where it's not, and then people get uh, get happy when it's like that, right? People like yeah, it. Yeah. it. It's great to see the years where there's only two balls or whatever, and you just have to push the balls back on the rack. But, right, right. But the, the most of the time, you're talking about dozens and dozens of objects you have to bend over. Right, right, right. And we have to balance those needs with the needs of the game, right? right? You know, if, for example, in aerial assist, where there were just the two track balls on the field, the con- like the, the, the construct of that game allowed that. But in Steamworks, where we had all that fuel, if we had only had five pieces of fuel, because that would have been easy for field reset, that took out that whole construct. We couldn't have played that game that way. Yeah. So it's, it's just, you, we have to find that balance. Excuse me. And then, obviously, we really want to try to have a competition between alliances. And of course, when I say that, people say, well, what about Recycle Rush? And in some ways, Recycle Rush wasn't about a competition between alliances, but there still was a winner and a loser. It, a winner and a not winner, I guess you could say. Yeah. Um, because we don't, you know, it, that game was still about a competition between alliances. You still had to do better than your opponent to move forward, even if it wasn't the head-to-head alliance you were on the field with. Right. So we do still want to set up that concept of a competition. That's really important to us. So, so what you're saying is that, so for example, in like first Lego League, right, where they right. they only play by themselves most of the time minus the whatever shared mission right is yep. that is that a, a direction you would see first uh, the first box competition never going down or as like a an edge case sort of more toward the recycle rush side yeah it's hard to say well whenever you talk about game design because I, honestly when we start this process we start at zero okay. every season oh, so wow. it's hard to say never um it's that will never do something or will never make this decision because it's a, it's a crazy world out there. And as technology, honestly, as technology changes, the, the, our game design is allowed to change. Just when you think about, I mean, I've only been involved in, in, I know I say this only because I know a lot of people who have been involved in FRC for like, since the beginning of human time, <laughs> but I've only been involved since 2008. And when I look at the at the game process over that time, it's really evolved because of the technology that we've been able to bring in and 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 really enhance the game experience. So it's hard to say never. But your example of the first Lego League kind of cooperative game is likely not is typically not something we focus on in first robotics because we do want to set up that concept that, you know, each alliance is trying to outweigh the other alliance. Okay, cool. Yeah. So let's see what's next. How are we doing? Is this? Ta- am I talking too much? Oh no, this is great. We're we're okay. we're we're talking about great stuff. And and right, we. Great. By the way, everybody who's watching, keep asking questions. I've got a couple queued up. Once we get to a good point to to talk about them, so keep okay. on going. Great. So we're gonna go to the next one. And so then this background is actually where my parents live up in Maine. This is oh. where I grew up. So this is a nice, beautiful fall day. So I thought I would add it. But um, for those of you who don't really care about any of this stuff, you can just look at the pretty pictures. 
Um, but so let's, I just, I did want to talk through the process and the timeline, just, just as a kind of an overall picture. Um, so, and, and this is specifically about infinite recharge, but you can pick any year. Um, so in 2000, just as a background in 2018, the game design, we ha we got enough people on staff that we actually split into two game design groups. So my group did 2018 and then the other group did Destination Deep Space in 2019. And so at the end of 2018, which was Power Up, one of the, my opinion, one of the most fun games, um, Power Up, at the end of Power Up, we came back from championship. And so that began the Infinite Recharge story. So in May of 2018, the whole uh, group, and this is a big group, it's not just FRC Engineering. We have folks from development and uh, strategic sourcing and marketing and um, education and diversity and inclusion. Like we want to include everybody when we do this process. So this large group selects a game concept from what we call the bench. Okay. And there are X number of game concepts on the bench. And they these are like um, really skeletons of games. They're just really basic conceptual ideas that with some, you know, general concepts of what could be on the field with some general understandings of what the game pieces are. And we just have this, I, we have this conversation, like what fits with the, you know, theme we're working on cross program, what fits with the development of over time of kind of where we are in first robotics competition, what fits sort of like all, like all these, all these like nuanced issues, what really fits. And so we all talk about it. And as a large group, we decide on one concept to pull from the bench. Now, can I, can I just ask real quick? I know if, sure. I, I think it was about a year and a half, two years ago, you guys, sort of put out an invitation for people to submit. Is this where those things, if they were good, would have gone? Yes. Okay. This is where those ideas, and, and I will say, anybody watching, if you have a great idea for a game, send it to FRC Team Advocate at firstinspires.org, and we'll get it on the bench. Because we always are looking for really great game concepts. And to be fair, you don't need to build a whole game. Because it takes us 18 months plus to build a game. Like, it's likely that you're not going to come up with a concept that's fully baked, but just send us your ideas because we'll, we, we do love to hear from the community about that. So we do. So that's another story. We did build the bench, but that's fine. So it's on the bench. We pull a concept off from May of 2018 through November of 2018. My team worked on the bench concept and really started flushing out ideas of what this game was going to look like. And we had a lot of different challenges that we were working on because the and the overall theme for 2020, the cross-program theme, was this concept of like architecture and infrastructure and what does it take for a city to be successful and grow. And so we were trying to, we worked really hard, like trying to get this concept across. In December of 2018, we that's when we kind of started finalizing this the the relationship with Star Wars and Lucasfilms and Star Wars Force for Change and that they were going to come on board with this with our season theme. And at that point our game design team said what kind of opportunities does this provide for us? And we were really really excited about that. So we actually reevaluated the whole thing. We didn't start from zero cuz we had some really nice concept built in okay. but we did relook at the whole process and say if we were to tell this story with a star wars idea how would it change oh and that's where we came that's kind of where the story of the generator shield to protect the city came into play because that's a clearly a star wars story right like that's you know you got to put your shield up and protect yourself from yeah. whatever's going on in the universe and that story is like full through all of the films, right? Like someone's always trying to get the generator shield down or up or, <laughs> or redirecting whatever. power from one side to another yeah, or whatever. Yeah, like you right. gotta, you're always doing something with the yeah. shield in all the films. So that was something that really resonated with us, and that's that. So we reevaluated the reevaluated our game concept to fit in with this really nice Star Wars themed story. So, so can and I then, ask? Oh yeah. Um, how much? I don't want to be like how much did it change, right? But like, yeah, it, it, is there anything that like I would expect to be on that 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 we saw in the field that got that that w 
he, well, did, we, did anything get lost or added because of this? Or was it mostly yeah, a, a well, theming and sort of shapes kind of thing, right? In fact, if you had seen the game before and saw the game now, there's really only one thing that followed through, and that was shooting the balls into the goal. Oh, wow. So the shield generator was completely new. The control panels were completely new. That all came from this reevaluation process. Wow. And okay. I don't want to give away what the old game was because some of that stuff got back, like put back on the bench because they were really we had done a lot of work. So yeah, and that got put back on the bench that, for the next one. And right? that we can answer this really quickly. Somebody asked this question. Um, this the question was asked by Mister Wow Two Two. They asked, "Could could rejected game ideas be released to teams for mock kickoffs or other practices?" I guess that that's that gives a the, really great idea. Yeah. You know, we haven't really. Uh, so, that, so first of all, it's a great idea. Second of all, when we, so when we did, so I will tell a little bit of story about how we build the bench. Um, and I don't want to derail this conversation too much, but what we got together with some folks from representatives from the community and the engineering team. And we went through all those community concepts that you talked about, Francis, which we got a bunch. We got like 20 something. Oh. Um, plus we all brought our own ideas because that's part of our, our job description actually is to think of games right um and so we brought our own ideas we had like i think 20 something from the community we so we took those and kind of like grouped them together into these themes and then like said okay we'll take like that aspect from that and that aspect from that and then we like boiled it all down into uh x number of which was far less than the number we started with and so some stuff actually did like not get thrown out but sort of got refocused into a different concept yeah so that is a that's an interesting idea i will i'll definitely bring it back cool to, to all right yeah great idea what was that mr wow uh, mr wow 22 so thank yeah. you sir yeah um so then we start so we we figured out that we're going to be able to like tell the star wars story and got really excited about this shield generator process and then from january of 2019 through december of 2019 so basically all of 2019 we built infinite recharge and so when it, it's easy for me to say those words, built infinite recharge, like three words that encompass essentially half of our life at <laughs> work is spent working on this game. Yep. So I have nine people on my team. I mean, you can do the math pretty quickly. We work, we're assigned to work 40 hours a week. Half of that time is on game is on this game. Like it's a big chunk of hours. It's a big chunk of our lives. It's what we think about. It's what we talk about when we're together. It's what we we have conversations about. Like it's we we really this is who we are as a group. Is are these game designers that really try to give our teams the best possible experience? And so what that means for the timeline is that we we get the game to about 85 we'd like to say between like 80 80 and 90 percent done and then we'll go to the next slide um and then we have our outside community come in and say yes kind of give us some feedback and that happens in july and then from august through december is when we do all of those what i will call what i will call the nitty-gritty details because we have concepts of what the rules are, we have ideas of what the rules are, but the process of manual writing is very, very intense because we think about literally every single word in the manual and whether it should be a and, right? Like, is it but or is it and, right? Like these tiny, we, we have discussions about every word because it's really important to, for us to tell the message that's clear, that someone could read the manual and say, yep, I get it. I don't need, I don't need the Q and A. I don't need, I know exactly how the refs are going to call it. Right. Like that's yeah. kind of our goal. Unreasonable and, never happens, but that's okay. We <laughs> well, I, I will say this. I, as an, as an impartial observer here, I was very impressed with the manual this year because I basically didn't have to read the Q and A at all. Like normally there's sort of like the day one patch that comes out where we sort of like, Oh gosh, we forgot that like this thing is obviously yeah. not going to be like this. And they fix you, you all fix it in team update one. Uh, but that didn't really happen this year. And then a lot of the Q&A questions were uh, uh, more like just read the manual more closely and it'll explain what you're asking about, you know? Yeah. And that it, that's really, and I, first of all, thank you. And, and we've heard tons of positive community f feedback from the community about that. And it really is a reflection on the fact that we have split into two teams and 
had so much time to work through this manual. Yeah. So because we involve a lot of people too, we involve, so obviously my team writes it. The other team gives feedback. We have our senior head refs and chief re- two chief referees. Their team helps us a great deal. We had many, many, many meetings. We had three rounds of feedback with them. Like there's just the number of hours that go into this, the development of these rules and the game and the game manual is, is just a lot. It's a lot from our volunteers is a lot from us. And so I, I really appreciate you saying that because we really did want to make this manual really usable. And I think I'd, I'd like to say that this is how it will be going forward, just because we have so much more time yeah. to develop the ideas and really flesh them out, which is powerful. That's great. And then, of course, in the fall, we do all the fun stuff. We do, you know, the kickoff, the kickoff filming and the um, the field tour videos and the teaser release and kind of all those like more, you know, fun, fun kind of activities. <laughs> so. <laughs> So um, we have a, a question here that's related to this sort of topic. It's okay. from uh, uh, BJ S- uh, Simons. They're asking, how do you avoid, when you, during this process, how do you avoid a design by committee? Who makes the tough calls between many good ideas to create a sort of more cohesive product? Is that you? It's such a great question because, and, and I know that, you know, lots, lots and lots of people out there can imagine how, like, how do you get to an idea? Like, how do you get to a feeling? How do you get to a solution? And I will say that it's not necessarily the prettiest, like, journey. Because we're, all of us, every one of us is so passionate about our experiences in FIRST, what we've seen in the community, what we think the community will like, that we often, oftentimes, we get into these discussions that are really, really intense. Yeah. And we have to walk away so that people can take time to think through what they're what they really want like you as as a game design committee member you have to ask yourself at all times is this the is this the argument is this where i'm going to stand in my spot and not move and honestly i know this is going to sound cliched but all of us also really do take the mission of first very seriously and we we do try to be the gracious professionals that so that we can come to consensus And I will say in this game, there were less than you could probably count on one hand the number of times when when someone had to come in or I had to say, like, this is the direction we're going. And it wasn't a group honestly come to say not necessarily consensus because but it is a process of saying, I can see your point. I'm going to give on this one, but I'm going to, you know, but in trade for right. this other thing that I also feel really passionate about. So, well, and, and that's, you know, not to, not to bring it to me, but like the, um, that's how my team does our robot design philosophy, right? Like there, yep. it's, it's good to have thoughts and feelings, but at some yeah. point you have to ask yourself, how important is what I'm saying? Like, am I willing to exactly. sort of like, you know, we say that we jokingly say the word fall on my sword for this particular, like, yeah. Yeah. Point. Or we can have I, all can kinds I of on? terrible yeah. euphemisms that we say, which I won't say on yeah. air because okay. it's not really appropriate. But it's exactly right. You have to say, just like in the real world, when you're trying to design a product, you've got to say with your team, no one like makes stuff up on their own. Everybody's working in groups. Everybody's working together. And ultimately, yes, there is a leader who, at the end of the day, does have to like mah, chop, 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 say this is this and that is that. But that like that kind of stuff isn't really that successful honestly and every all you all of you on a team know this that the that the the robots that are most successful is when everybody has a say and everybody's voice can be heard and you take the time to get to the right decision yep. and not just saying like well i know everything so it's this it's like no you got to there's a learning process here so yeah I guess that's a long answer to no, that's great. that question, which may not may or may not be satisfying to someone. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Shall we go to the next one? Sure. Let's take a look. All right. So this one is an actual example. So the, one of the reasons I had to put in these goofy pictures is because I can't share a lot of most of the stuff that I have to share would be considered confidential. So this, though, is an actual slide from one of the presentations that I made on behalf of the 2020 team way back in the summer of 2018. Wow. So when we first started on this game, one of the things we really wanted to do a shooting game. We just like, 
we just wanted a shooting game. We hadn't done a shooting game in a long time. We had, you know, people say like, oh, everyone knows how to build a shooter. It's no, as, as most of you saw in 2020. Like, it's a hard process to it build is. a shooter and it takes a lot of design. You can like go out and look at other people's designs. You can look at past stuff. It's all great. But to do it yourself and to get it right is hard work. And we really wanted that because we hadn't had it. It's in a, in a whole generation of kids had never built built a shooter and everyone says yeah but they built a fuel shooter they did but this shooter was very different from that shooter so we really wanted this shooting game so and and the second thing we really wanted was this ski ball concept where you had a goal that you were shooting at but if you missed you still got points and that because that's a dynamic that we haven't had in either a really long time or ever some people argue that we've had it before but it was i don't know 2007 or something i i'm terrible at my first history so <laughs> don't quote me on that um but the concept that you could be shooting at a goal and if you missed you still got points for it we really wanted to develop that was one of the kind of ideas that we latched onto really quickly and we're really proud of and it played out. I only went to I went to three events. I went to Los Angeles North, and I was in Turkey for both Istanbul and Bosphorus. And it, it played out in the matches I saw. It played out beautifully in the way that we had all imagined. It. So this is the number of people that we have to get um, approval for at first headquarters is really incredible because oh. it's not just like the nine of us who sit around and be like, yeah good idea like we have to we so obviously our strategic sourcing department which is the group that has to go out and get all this stuff either purchased or or um like all the contractors to like build all the stuff that we need like they obviously we have to work really closely with them and and they have to be able to say like yep that's that's a game piece just just getting the game piece is a giant ordeal because you know you don't when you're a school or when you're a, a human, you don't go out and buy whatever, 24,000 of these <laughs> things, right? Yeah. Like it's, it's a lot. Well, and, and, so, and, and not just buying them enough for first and all the events, but also buying them and not buying out of them so teams can actually use them. Right, right, right. We need to make sure there's enough on the market. Like that's a, like, I know some people think we don't think about that stuff, but it's really important to us that stuff we use is available to teams. And so you know, strategic sourcing, we were close. Obviously, we work super close with marketing because the whole relationship with Disney and Lucasfilms this year was a that was a lot of time. It was a lot of conversations. It was a lot of really great work, but it's time consuming. So we got to we at work with them. Um, we have to work with our our president. And I so I was I met lots of times with Don Bossy before he left. And then, you know, um, Larry came in right when we started. So we didn't meet so much with him. Um, and and even we have to get we we even need to go to Dean and and um, before Woody pass Woody to have them say like yep this makes sense like this is something that we can get excited about this is something that we can talk about this is something that we can make work um, obviously our development department we work really close with because this is you know they've got to we have to design something that is going to make our our suppliers and our sponsors and our supporters excited so the number of presentations that I've given about this game is it's Oh, there's a it's a lot let's just say that and this is an actual slide from one of the really early ones where we um gave this idea so i, I think it's interesting that you, you you frame it as shooting and then missing right <laughs> well no but, it, but it's it's interesting because i think a lot of teams this year kind of looked at it from the other direction just because of the dynamics of the of the yeah. physical space where it was like i'm gonna kind of yeet it into the goal aim for the center but just kind of like my target's actually the outer goal mostly yeah, I do think, so I, again, I saw I saw probably more matches than most people, yeah. although I didn't watch anything online. I saw probably more live matches than most people. And I do think that that ended up being the strategy for a lot of teams, which is totally respectable. This right. was, that's the beauty of first robotics competition is that, and that's when you know, I, I think for us, that's when we know we did a good job with the game design is that you don't walk out on the field and go do this and you're going to win. Yeah. Because you got to have a lot of really interesting strategic decisions for teams to make so that it's not, it doesn't become just like a single, you know, kind of snooze fest of like, oh, guess what they're going to do this time? Like this, this, right? Which is what <laughs> we don't want to do. And right. that's really the great part about about this, about our game design process is that we really do want to see lots of different strategies and, and what works for one team isn't going to work for others. So I love that. I, I love that you pointed that out, Francis. I think it's probably 
probably true for a lot of teams. Yeah. Oh, I'm on slides. Sorry. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, all right. Good. Next. So this is a picture of some of the vegetables that I harvested from my garden. Oh. Um, yep. <laughs> big. I'm, I'm a big gardener. So, Very cool. Uh, is that yep. is that in in uh, New Hampshire? Yeah, so okay. I live actually about two miles from headquarters, oh. and I live on a small piece of land, but my wife and I don't like mowing the lawn, so <laughs> we have raised beds everywhere, and we don't mow the lawn, so oh. these are some peppers, these are ancho poblano peppers, and some gorgeous eggplants. I gotta get my parents to do that tomato. too, so I don't have to mow their yeah. lawn. <laughs> So worst thing in the world. I hate mowing my lawn. <laughs> so one of the fun, one of the most fun experiences that we have as a game design team is that we invite members of the community into. We, they come to first headquarters and they provide feedback on the rules. And uh, this happens in July before kickoff, so about six months before kickoff, and we invite them in. And the most important thing to know about this is that when they come in. This is not a game review. They're not coming in and saying, this game's dumb. You should do this other game that I thought of. And I happen to bring my big fat binder for it. The game is the game. And the feedback we're looking for is about the rules and the structures that they see and experience. And how, you know, things we've forgotten, things we didn't think about, things we things that just were out of our scope at the time. Whatever it is, we kind of allow them to think through this. And it's a, it's a two-day review. They come in. Um, typically we start Friday at noon and then we go all the way to Sunday at noon and it's just the whole time. It's just, wow. they just take a look at the game, read the rules. We have the field set up so they can kind of like do some walkthroughs with potentials, look at actual spaces, designs, try to think about what robot designs might work. Is our scoring structure right? Cause that's really a big part of success of game design is making sure the scoring structure is right. Right. Hey, I, real quick about about the field yeah. thing. Do you guys so like we we see the field with all of its beautiful graphics and metal and everything? Do you guys have like a like we'll call it a team version set up at that point, or are you already in like building out the real field? We try to have as much of the field built out of actual metal for the rules review as possible. Okay. Um, I believe this year we had the goal, the powerport. Excuse me. Uh, the human player station was still wooden. Okay. Um, the, str the truss though was up, like it was really the truss and the shield generator switches were made out of sheet metal, but it was not the final, it didn't end up being the final version. And of course there was no artwork because, because okay. we didn't start the artwork process until September. Um, so kind of, yes and no. I mean, it wasn't, it's kind of a mix of what the, what a team field version would be and, and what the real field is. Of course, nothing is, I, I shouldn't say of course, but typically nothing is in its, it's, is in its final stage. Um, because we do get some really good feedback from the rules review group. Okay. And we know that typically what they're going to tell us is valuable information. <laughs> We're going to have to make a lot of changes. So yeah. Um, but, don't, we, but don't, it kind of depends. Yeah. Okay. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. So you think about like for the human player station, for example, there wasn't a big difference between the wooden team versions and the field versions. If you thought about the way that you interacted with them. So it's really kind of, you know, it depends, honestly. Okay. Um, and then, so lots of people say, well, what do you get out of this rules review? Like, is this really important? What do you see? And so I just picked out three examples from 2020 where we got actually super valuable feedback from the rules review team. So the first one was the vision target placement. And originally in the infinite recharge game, the vision target on the power port was actually right in the middle of the power port itself. Okay. So it was about four feet off the ground, kind of right in the middle or four and a half feet. And so the rules review group came in and they were like, no, like these limelights are going to be shining right in the opposite player's eyes. Oh, yep. Okay. That'll and do it. so they were like, you got to think this, you got to rethink this. It's just not, this is not it, like, is it even safe? And then even when we moved the um, vision target up to the high goals, we still struggled with people having concerns about those limelights and other and other lighting being in their eyes yep. and so it was really great feedback from them um that was that was a that was a great example 
And then another one that they um, suggested to us was that blocking shots. So at the time, there were some different uh, zone restrictions on robot height. Okay. And the, some, and so when you were in a certain part of the area, you could be a little bit higher. It, you know, the forty-five inches at the time was actually forty-eight inches, and um, you know, in some in certain areas, like when you were down on your end of the field, on your driver's end of the field, which would have been your opponent's goal end of the field, you could actually be a little higher. And the feedback was, this game, this sh- the shooting in this game is actually quite difficult. Yeah. And you blocking shots, this it just wasn't the right feel for the game we were trying to create. Not saying it's not a good game design concept, but in this particular situation, it wasn't. It just wasn't the right answer. So that was another really good piece of feedback that they gave us. And then the third one was probably the most important one that teams benefited from was that we actually had the high goal, the inner goal, as only eight inches when mm. it was first <laughs> when <laughs> when they came in. Yikes! That would have been really and, hard. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And they were like, no, you need to have it much bigger. In fact, in fact, twice as big as the ball. And I think now it's like 14 inches. Yeah. I think it's 14 or whatever. It's in the neighborhood. Yeah. Yeah. So that was. um, And so for us, we thought that this we thought that it was going to be too easy. In fact, that the um, outer goal was so big that it was going to be way too easy to to work with. And oh. they were like, no, don't worry about that. You need to make <laughs> the, the inner goal bigger. Wow. And actually, let me go back one slide and see if. So you can see the concept of this game originally was that both goals were going to be round, the outer goal and the inner goal. And then we switched the outer goal to the hexagon. Oh, OK. Because it was a little, little easier to cut out at home. Oh, oh, wow. That's that's awesome. I mean, yeah. it was yeah. easier to cut out. And I I didn't even think yeah. about that because I don't. Yep. <laughs> I when I when I, the, I had to learn how to use so many different woodworking tools to get all those round holes in the rocket last year. So I am glad you guys thought about that because that's great. Yeah, it was one of those things that someone you know we talked about in passing. It could have been one of the re- rules review, and I didn't write it down. Yeah. but it did change in that time frame. It changed from round to hexagon because it was just one of those things that you know asking teams to make a, a round hole that size is it's challenging it's not like it's impossible but it's no. challenging and if yeah. you're if you're really working with simple tool simple hand tools you know at, at your you know maybe you're a team that doesn't even have a work woodworking shop or maybe you're a team that's just working in a classroom like that's it's challenging to do and we and we were really thinking um it also it also did well for us for the vision target because vision target on pretty difficult. Um, oh, to wrap the, the to wrap the tape target much much easier to do. Although oh. we probably would have come up with a different design at the time had it been a goal, had yeah. it been a round goal. So, so uh, kind of on this here topic a little yeah. bit, um, we have a question from Steph Morrison. She's asking, yeah, um, do you build robots for the game, and how much like full robots, or do you build like fully functional FRC style robots, or do you build like wooden prototypes like those those faux bots that first had many many years ago for the kickoff? Do you guys do any yeah. any actual testing like that? That's a really great question and and one that we get asked a lot and and the answer is it depends on the game, quite frankly. Okay. Um in this particular game, we did build a a full working shooter. Um because we wanted to and I know I've had this conversation with so many people they're like you didn't do enough testing on those game pieces and like we shot those balls like thousands and thousands and thousands of times through shooters and it they just didn't act the way that they did on the field. Like it just is what it is, right? Like oh, the end. Okay. Um, so we did build we did build an actual shooter for this game. Now, is it a legal FRC robot for this season? Probably not. Um, only because we have a couple of drive bases that we've had around for a number of years. So and because of uh, because our you know our frame perimeters are cha- sometimes change on distances and lengths and you know in 2015 there wasn't even one like we do have some standard drive bases that we use as our drive bases for our practice robots so is it inspectable absolutely not does it have a control system on it yes it does it has a real control system it runs on the same battery that teams use okay um typically they don't weigh the 120 to 150 pounds um for like our shooter robot didn't um, which was, brings us to another great question because we had this really intense 
hanging game this season and what did we do to test that and we actually didn't build robots we built platforms with hooks on them that were uh pneumatic that oh. could, so they could lift themselves up it was not let me just put it again these are not frc legal robots these were like hooked up to compressors and stuff so that we could just like run them when we wanted to um but then we just would put like like with the uh the generator switches um we just would like put different weights on them right and like hang them in different places and see what would happen and that was a really you know for us that was a really interesting kind of lots of, there was so much in experimentation with those generator switches to try to figure out like what are they going to do cuz in your mind you think like oh it's just going to be a teeter totter and that's fine yeah. but the robots had actually like several planes of motion depending on how they like hooked onto them yeah and so it caused these like weird shifting motions in the shield generator when it really got moving and so we actually did have frc weighted robots that we would you know get them latched on lift up and then kind of get them swinging to see what would happen both to test you know lots of things like how was our level range the right range was the um protect like the hard stops were they going to work yeah. were they like in the way were they were people's hooks going to like grab onto them that was one one of the really big issues that we thought about a lot because we have these spaces where like obviously robots were going to use these hooks to hook on the bar that's kind of what we assumed that the majority of teams would do right but there are lots of places where those hooks could get hooked onto the truss they could get hooked yeah. onto the onto the hard stops and so we were you know kind of getting those switches those hooks you know we tried to get them to hook on different places to see what the likelihood would be so so yes and no so we do have um, it, and, it, and it does depend on the game we do have robots that are you know that that run you know why just like yours do they run on a wireless access point and we run them with the same radio and the same re the same rio the same control system everything same batteries and we shoot stuff and, and that and then with the generator switches though it didn't you know it didn't make sense to use real robots for that because it was easier for us to just kind of use these pneumatic setups and then just pour a bunch of weights on right like right just like got weights from the weight room and just what well, I, I think that sort of mimics it to a certain extent what a lot of teams do in their prototyping right. phase too they'll try hooking some things together is it heavy enough nope okay throw some sand on it or whatever right exactly. and then see what happens right uh, exactly kind of related to what you were talking about a little bit i'll, I'll ask this other question here this is from uh ask a robo tier 5291 they're asking how does the, the GDC go about determining robot size rules from year to year, specifically concerning uh, height and the frame perimeter? Because we've, yeah. we've seen it change from year to year, but it's not immediately obvious why all the time. Yeah, this, this is such a great question because we talk about this a lot. It's a really big deal to us when we talk about what is the frame perimeter going to be and how high can robots go? Because when you... When you're thinking about the dynamics of a game, for example, in infinite recharges, shooting capacity, right? Like we have a goal that's high off the ground and we have this generator switch that's high off the ground. How are we going to like, what is it? What's the movie in our minds that we want to see? Yeah. Do we want to see robots like when we're shooting, like, do we want to see catapulting robots where they just like lift their whole mechanisms up and like dump in? Or do we really want to see balls like moving across the court? Like there, it really depends on the kind of game structure we're looking for. And I know that's not really a great answer, but that's, that's one of the places where we start actually is what is it, what kind of experience do we want to see teams have? And then the, lots of decisions are made for safety reasons. So oh. this year, one of the things that my team was really concerned about is that we love the generator switch game end which i i think that that lots of people also loved that ending um you know i saw lots of discussion about whether or not the scoring was right um but that's like a different discussion but we just we love this ending however we did not want to see robots driving down the field at full speed right like 18 feet per second and then slam into that generator <laughs> switch oh i right? would have loved like, to see that that'd be so cool yeah like once <laughs> it would be cool for exactly what exactly one time oh no <laughs> so we really wanted that's one of the reasons why the um height was so low this year mm. because we didn't want any teams accidentally slamming into that generator switch even if it was swinging 
and that was just super important to us. Um, so that's that's it. It the robot size really depends on the on the on the um, the game dynamics and what we're worried about seeing and what we're kind of worried about teams making decisions that they don't realize that they're making that could get that could go really poorly and then yeah. they would feel you know just not have a positive experience because that would be crummy yeah so then that brings up the discussion about the, tr- the about the trench run right so we have this kind of open field this season but then we put this tunnel around the edges and so you know we really wanted to see robot diversity this season in yeah. design similar to 2016 we're in stronghold right like essentially team said am i going to go under the low bar or am i going to say don't worry about it i'll have my alliance partner do that i'm going to have a you know i'll have an easier time shooting by being a tall robot and and that's really um robot design diversity is important to us and so that's what we were hoping to get from the trench Yes. Which actually, I, I think we actually did okay on, right? Yeah. There were some tall robots and there were some short robots. And that's really nice. It's nice to see people put stuff in like tiny little packages, which is always fascinating. But it's also nice to see teams use their vertical height to their advantage. Right. Which this season, you did have to make some significant design choices if you are going to go under the trench. Yes, certainly. I mean, and, yeah. and, and you bring up 2016. And I think this year was a lot more successful in that aspect because... Yeah. We saw a lot in 2016 that basically, you know, I would say probably 80% of robots went under the bar because mm-hmm. they, they didn't want to have to do the drawbridge. Um, right. <laughs> but, but, uh, but this year it was the, the middle of the field was a lot more navigable than, um, than trying to go over the drawbridge, for example. So, um, so yeah. it, it had a lot more success in that realm. Yeah, and one of the things that's different was is significantly different from Stronghold compared to Infinite Recharge is that you could only hold one ball in Stronghold. Yeah. So you didn't really have to worry about where am I going to put all these balls if I have to be under a 20 inch low bar, right? Whereas the this you had to have this conversation with your team, or I hope you had this conversation with your team to say, all right, we can hold five balls. Those don't take up zero amounts of space. So if we're going to pick them up, they got to go somewhere. So are they going to go like we saw some teams with these really elaborate um, serializers that were going kind of going around in a circle, right? Yep. So that takes up, you know, this much space. But then we saw other teams who just did kind of this linear thing, right? Like I took them in here, I went this way, and I lifted up. And that is, you know, for some teams that was easier because they used more of their vertical height, but they gave up going under the, the uh, trench. And yep. so it's really, um, you know, those robots had less distance they had to reach for the generator switch right those low robots had further to go so yep. that was that was also a design a design decision you had to make so we do really try to build games that create nice robot design diverse like diversity yeah um and and so that's kind of how we build out those those decisions about frame perimeters and heights is you know what do we want to see what's on the field and how can we you know how can we protect our teams from damaging their robots in ways that we really don't want them to damage them. Yeah. And, and to not to to sort of toot my team's own horn here, but we also saw some robots that also went in the other direction who wanted to be tall, but also go into the trench and were able to do something totally different and convert their whole robot to go up and down. We saw multiple robots do that this year. Yep. Which is also one of those things. Which is cool. Yeah. It's very cool. cool. And it's something you couldn't have seen otherwise. Right. So. Yep. All right. Um, do you have any other stuff you oh, want to cover goodness, with us? Sorry, sl- I keep forgetting. No, no, no. I, 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 no, no, no. I, that's okay. I, I was going to say because I think we're almost to the end. Let me know if you've got oh, anything else to cover. And um, well, let's see what the next slide is. Yeah, I have one. I do have one more. Oh, I don't have one more slide. Okay. I did want to say I my favorite um, fast food place here, uh, In and Out. <laughs> Excellent. You know, it's it's good <laughs> stuff. I can't I can't disagree with that. So yeah. All right. Well, well, with that that sort of part of the of the discussion. Um, over with what we'll do is we have i have approximately a ton of questions um from people in the chat that i've been trying to peek peek through here and there as you've been discussing it but i think what we'll do is we'll probably um start talking more about those and and answer some of them so if you've got questions folks in the chat um why don't you go ahead and ask them in the chat with the uh command exclamation point q and we'll make sure that you uh, it gets taken. And then for the best ones, we'll try to answer them here. Now, just as a word of warning, there's a lot of questions in the chat right now. So we're probably not going to answer everybody's, but we'll try to answer as many as we can. 
within reason. Yeah, um, definitely. Yep, because I, I need to eat dinner, and I'm sure Jamie wants to uh, end her <laughs> evening before midnight as well. So, all right. So uh, uh, one quick question here that came up earlier. Uh, this is from um, Eric, Eric Orlowski here. They ask, is there any thought that goes into the number of things for spectators to focus on? In many sports, there's a very clear focal point for spectators, I would assume like a ball. Uh, mm-hmm. But a lot of FRC games seem like there are six robots doing their own thing a lot of time. That, such a great question. And I will say that, you know, when we think about, so I, so just to start, um, I don't know that it's, it's certainly not like a sacred worm, we'll say, <laughs> but it is, it definitely is a consideration when we think about the game flow process. So for example, in infinite recharge, if you were, let's say that you walked in and you didn't know anyone on the field, you just happened to find this thing. Um, if you just sort of watch the whole field for the match, you'd see some really great action of balls like flying through the air. But at the end of the match, all six robots come to the center. Oh, okay. So one thing that we really wanted to, that, and that was actually one of our uh, one of the our our thoughts this year that we wanted to see was that at the end of the match, during the end game, there was kind of one single focus point in the center. And so when you when you think about different FRC games, there are focus points sort of, but in general, I think that this person is right, that typically, especially if you show up and you're watching, like say that you're, you know, you're you care about team whatever. 9003 and you so then you just watch 9003 and it does feel like there's this whole world going on outside of just that one robot but i think if you kind of look at the big picture we do try to have focal points at different sections of the match okay cool so kind of yes but also kind of no and i do understand what this person is what this person is saying yeah all right so this this question here is from off and back on is there a twitch name here they're asking can you talk about the importance of uh, diversity of experience on the GDC? As in, uh, what out of the box experiences or insight have members of the GDC brought to the table? Uh, like mem- like the actual team members? I think yes, that's that's what they're Is trying that what to. You mean? Yeah, I believe so. Wow. Okay. We're hitting you with the easy so, ones first, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I guess I mean so. It, it, at the end of the day, it's FRC Engineering who's on the game they make up what we call the core team. Okay. We do have some outside folks who, who give insight at times. And those folks are also from inside first. Like, well, we have our rules review who are select members of the community who come in and give us some advice. We do have our senior head refs and the, and the chief refs who oh. help us. Obviously we have our two co-chief LRIs who help us. Um, and then we have folks from like strategic sourcing and marketing and, and, and diversity inclusion who come in. But at the end of the day, the game design core team is made up of the engineers at first. And so as much as diversity as can happen in a group of engineers. Okay. And so that being said, you know, when you when we go to hire people onto the engineering team, we do look for those really as you ex- as you described out of box experiences. And, you know, and the skill sets that people can bring into this perspective is is super important to us. But we're all engineers. Yeah. So you do have to kind of keep that in your mem- in your mind when you think about it. The great part about all of us, though, is that we do represent um, lots of different parts of the of the country. Um, no different parts of the world yet, although we did have an intern from. So that's something. Oh, where, where were they from? It ticked um, out for a second. Uh, Ontario. Oh, cool. Canada. Oh, nice. sorry, you, it came out for a second. So they were from they were from Canada. Okay. Um, and then so some and then a bunch of us have kind of individual diverse backgrounds. So like I was a teacher. Um, I also coach a team that um, arguably doesn't build like amazing robots. We're more of like you know in the middle of the pack. Yeah. Um, and I think that that's really. Uh, that's really important for the perspective part of it. Um, we have people who have been on teams that would describe themselves as like elite teams. Yep. And we have people who have been on teams who would describe themselves at, in kind of the lower section of teams. Developing. Um, yeah, developing. That's a good word. 
um, we we do have folks on our game design team who have who work in FRC but are not engineers, which is very valuable marketing backgrounds or um, like event management backgrounds. Um, to be clear, I'm not an engineer. I have my but most people just call it the same thing because like it's STEM career, so yeah. I, which I get. Um, but yeah, I guess I think that kind of answers your question. I will say when we build the bench, we're looking for people with very diverse backgrounds. Okay. More of kind of, we really like to get people who are like gamers, like video gamers. We like to get people who are professionals in industry who have nothing to do with FRC. We get folks who are, you know, professors from MIT who have experience with working with college students, problem solving. Um, we do try to, our bench building process, we do try to get a really diverse group in. Okay. Less of the kind of engineering group, um, which is, you know, that's, it. we are who we are, I guess, yeah. is kind of the answer. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Great. All right. Um, uh, I'm going to also back to back with this person's question. Off and back on has some good ones here. They ask again, a different question. What's the most common uh, misconception or we'll say false rumor that you've heard about uh, first or the GDC? What maybe like what's one thing that you think people assume the GDC does that is not the case, at least not anymore? Um well I, I'm I'm gonna admit that I am uh like I believe in the good in our community and I really only try to listen to the good in our community. So I but I do think that I have heard people say sort of in a negative tone that we don't, that none of us have ever had team experience or we wouldn't write the rules the way that we do. Uh And I think that that is, um, it it really couldn't be more false because most of us have direct team experience. So to be clear, I've only been a coach. I'm not old enough to have been on a team or young enough. Yes. Yeah, sorry. I'm not young (laughs) enough to have been on a team, but I have been a coach outside of my position at first. Um, So I think that that's likely one of them. But you do Um, have people on staff that were students in the program and lots of people who are former and current mentors as well, right? Yeah, yeah. Lots of current mentors, lots of students, lots of folks who who were students on teams. Um, Yeah, uh, maybe that's... I think the thing about the GDC is that... it, it has transitioned over time. Okay. So it used to be when first first started, you know, Dean was actually on the game design group. And, you know, folks that were not first employees were on and like lot, it was very, um, it, like it was, it, you know, it was just not what it is today. And so, but that's really changed. Like it's changed in the last, you know, X number of years because now it's totally internal. The actual game design team core team is internal and so maybe that's a misconception Mm. if you've but you would have had to have been around first for a really long time yes um to to uh to even have that concept i mean back when recycle rush was was around i definitely heard some you know people say you know how could anyone have come up with this game but i think again like recycle rush had its had its positives and um there were some amazing robots that season oh and if gosh. we hadn't gone in that direction we never would have seen them yeah and so when you you know even games you know lunacy also gets a bad rap but um this full disclosure favorite game we've ever done is lunacy um, oh really yes and, oh but lunacy also gets a bad rap um but but i but i think that it, if we don't if the game design team doesn't go down those places we don't get to see that true like robot design experience, which as a community, you have to, sometimes you have to step back and look at the community as a common understanding of knowledge. And we can't make, we can't spread that knowledge if we don't push ourselves in different directions sometimes. Okay. And so I think that that's really important to remember when you see games that either maybe you don't really like or you, you know, you don't weren't really inspired by some of the robots, but like these tiny little pieces were brought into the whole community knowledge and it made us better. So really, um, yeah, 
I'm Ooh. not sure what the original question was now. Oh, what are the misconceptions? <laughs> yes. No, I think you answered yeah. that great. I think it was a great answer. Yeah. Um, so this is um, a question over here. This is from uh, user Schreiber MR. They're asking, is there a, a quote unquote backup game? Has it ever been used? For example, if a game piece supply suddenly fell through or something happened that caused the game to not work anymore on short term? Wow, that's a really good question because we spend so much time working closely with our vendors that we really, I, and I, this is such, such a cop out, so I am sorry, Schreiber and our MR, but we work so closely with our vendors and the groups inside first that make this happen that I don't know that we would get ourselves down that situation before we would know in time to like make a change. So, I, I mean, we do have two games working at the same time. Mm -hmm. So I guess technically there's a backup game, but it's not like on kickoff day, we have two games ready and we could run with either of them in that moment. Okay. Um, but there's no like, like secret game that's like hidden in a no. manila folder in someone's desk that only open no. in case of emergency. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. That's so disappointing. Uh, I, I don't say know. Yes. Like, sure. <laughs> And it's the water game. Oh, no. no. I'm, kidding. Uh, I'm kidding. Quick. I'm kidding. <laughs> oh, if only you could find out the game pieces and buy them out. <laughs> oh. No, there's no, like, you know, in emergency, break the glass kind of thing. Okay. Um, but, I mean, that's partly, I, I, I would say that most companies, groups, people that sort of do product development like this, which you could sort of say you're, the game is a product that yeah, you develop every yeah. year, right? That, like, yeah. most companies also don't have something like that in the books, right? If the product doesn't work, yeah. and that's why yeah, process just, exists, right? Yeah, yeah. I think when you think about, uh, so when you look at the history of FIRST and how much we've grown, there's going to come a time, so we still build a decent number, not so much an infinite recharge because we were more prepared, but up to infinite recharge, we really built, a, you know, some of the stuff, some of our field elements ourselves. Oh. So, like, in Steamworks, much of the field elements were actually built by the staff. Like we went in on Saturdays and like put those gear pulleys together and like, you know, whatever. Wow. Yeah. So there's going to come a point when that's not reality anymore. You know, we'll, we just won't have, it. that's just going to be impractical. So maybe we'll get to that point where there's like a, okay, there's this thing, but then if that company, you know, whatever, right? Like, the coronavirus happens again hopefully not but yeah. you know you get into that situation where a specific supply line is gone or a manufacturing process goes under or something like that that we might have a backup but like right now we're still maybe we just haven't scaled enough to get into that like backup emergency situation yeah. well and the other thing is too is that like having a backup game doesn't help if all of a sudden like oh no we can't get this one particular type of ball yeah you can't just change the ball no we have to go to a whole different game and start <laughs> over right like yeah you know, <laughs> you know yeah it doesn't really work that way we don't design you know we don't we didn't design infinite recharge for any other game piece than that one we used yeah. so we couldn't be like you know what we should do we should get a great big 12 inch ball and play with it like oh, it's not gonna fit through the shoots like, right yep yeah <laughs> all right so we've yeah. got a question here this is from uh robert roboteer 5291 uh, they're asking, does any consideration go into repeating the same challenges from year to year and what goes into making them unique to keep them fresh, i.e. endgame climbing from 2016, 2020? And you could also throw in 2004, you know, any number of other years that climb too. So Yeah. Yeah. It's This is such a great question. And it's something that we certainly, that all of us at first have talked about, because when you go out into the sports arena, you know, Nobody reinvents basketball every year <laughs> and teams play and they practice and they get better. They skill build. And you know what? Audiences come and watch. In fact, the NBA is like one of the most popular sports on the planet, right? Like yep. folks from around the world tune in and they don't play basketball any differently now than arguably they did back when it was invented. It's a ball through the hoop and you got to run to the other end and put your own ball in your hoop. Like, yeah. There's no magic there. So how come, I mean, you, you'd have to be crazy not to ask the question, how come we can't play the same game every season? And there's just, there is just a large number of very impactful reasons that we still hold dear to us that we want to 
give a new what you said product out to our community yeah and you know part of that is is the there's just so many reasons but one of the big things that that we're really passionate about and that first is really our mission is about is inspiring the next generation of scientists and engineers and part of that is practicing being an engineer and a scientist and everyone could argue like well if you played the same game you'd be able to like you know, make these tiny little minute changes, right? Like you'd always could get better. You always could, could force yourself to get better, but it, it doesn't allow those big design challenges to happen if you're playing the same game. So again, am I going to say it's never going to happen? No, because you can never say that in game design, right. but those, that's kind of some of the arguments about, about why we don't go in that direction. Now, when it comes to end games, I love this conversation because if you were to take every end game in FRC, how many do you legitimately now could you boil them down to? Uh, well, uh, three or four probably. There's we've got you got right? you got parking, climbing, climbing a different way, climbing a different way, <laughs> right? Uh, putting the thing on the thing or taking the thing off the thing, right? Yeah, like, I mean, it's when you, so the challenge that you face as a game designer is you say, okay, so we're going to make a new game this year. Okay, what's it going to be? All right, we're going to shoot some balls. Well, how is that different from whatever game you want to name that yep. had ball shooting in it, right? How is that different from Stronghold? I'm, I'm terrible with names. How is that different from the, the game and that everyone's favorite game who I, that whose name I can't remember with the, all the balls into the goal at the top of the driver's station oh 2006 aim high aim high how yeah. is it different from aim high how is it, right like right how is it different from the basketball game yes like, 2012 these yep. are the same game right so in a way we do play a lot of the same elements over it's just we try to tweak them enough so that the design engineering challenge is different so I one see. could argue that the end game of stronghold power up and infinite recharge were actually all the same thing, right? You had a bar, you had to grasp it, you had to lift yourself up. Right. But in all three games, the bar was a different height, a different length, and there were in, you know, in 2016 in Stronghold, you had the um, the tower there that you could interact with as a team, yep. which most teams use, right? In Infinite Recharge, there was nothing there. It was just you and your robot in the bar. So do we play the same games? I mean, a little bit, but we do try to bring in these like little element changes that require a design change overall. Yeah. Because we do think it, it, you know, people can hark back to those games to say like, oh, I'll go check out so-and-so's design from Stronghold and see what they did. But you can't build the exact same thing because it wouldn't work exactly the same way. Yeah, and and the other thing to take into account in my mind is that like a lot of a lot of the the nitty gritty about how things work depend on the whole game as a whole, right? Like, yeah, your climber from twenty sixteen might do one thing because you have to go low, or it might do something different in twenty nineteen or eighteen, or you know, et cetera, right? Like, so it's it's right. not just oh, it's hanging. You can't just say oh, yeah. it's hanging in a vacuum. Right? Yeah, it's like oh, it's hanging. Yep, but you had a different robot size. Yep weight potentially you had a different like there's just so you didn't have to worry about a shooter in 2018 like there are just so many different different aspects to these games that even though it's the same concepts they do create these really neat design challenges all right so um i got another question here uh this is from archer with two h's i don't know if that was on purpose okay. or not but uh they ask uh while it seemed difficult when watching the reveal uh video and or reading the manual it seemed that in game on the field, the variance for the shield generator being level seemed like a really wide range. Was this intended, or was it supposed to be much more uh, tight, or much more of a challenge for other teams? I love this question. I I love these questions. I love these kind of questions because when we maybe this goes back to the misconception thing mm. is that I feel like sometimes the community gets the gets the idea that we try to do things that are really hard and that we we really want teams to struggle in their development and and at the end of the day none of us do we wish that every single robot could be at the top of the game because we all know because we're from teams that when you're in that space you feel great yeah like even if you don't win if your robot does what you plan it's like the best thing in the world 
ask any team, anyone out there, ask your teammates. You know, obviously we all want to win, and this this is a competition, but we also just want to be excellent in ourselves. You know, so when we first when we first came up with this concept of this the teeter totter, which is originally kind of the concept that it was. Okay. We really wanted we we actually were like it's got to be level, like legit level. And then the more we talked about it, we thought, me, that doesn't really seem like, we, first of all, <laughs> how are we going to tell? Yeah. And then after we sort of ourselves put some robots on there, as I was describing before, we we're like this. No, this is way too hard. And so I love that this person hurt, like brought themselves back to kick off to say, when I first saw this, I thought it was going to be difficult. But when I went out on the field and played with my robot, it actually was really reasonable and yeah. kind of not easy, but it wasn't as difficult as I intended because that's really the magic of game design. When you can make something look hard, but be easy is when you typically you're in that really sweet spot for a game. And because that's what we want our community to think like, wow, this is super hard. Like I got to put in some, I, I need to think I got to work with my team. I got to look at resources. But when I get on the field, my robot does what I want. And that's really, that's, re that's for us. That's really the magic space that we want to be in is the looks hard is easy. Yeah. Yep. Uh, okay. So, and we, so well, just, just one more thing about infinite recharge. Yeah, yeah. We knew, we knew that the third that that fourth rank point with the control panel was going to be difficult. Yeah. We knew that. Yeah. So we wanted to have the third rank point be something that was accessible to teams. Mm -hmm. So that was really when we thought about it. You know, we 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 used 20 uh stronghold for a good example. Yeah. Um because the de the defenses taking down the defenses was relatively easy, let's say. Lots in lots and lots and lots and lots of matches. You teams got that rank point. Yep. But the f capturing the tower, we didn't really see that s successfully or predictably until we got later in the season and even to the higher levels of play. Yeah. And, and so, yeah. Go ahead. Sorry. No, yeah. I uh, see so you bring up a good point that, like, at uh, in 2016, crossing the defenses and getting the, the breach was basically automatic after a certain point. You know, yeah. and the, getting the tower was the, the challenging part. And we didn't, yep. we haven't played enough rounds of, of this game to sort of get to that point where we have that point where the hang is automatic. But I know right. that I was at a week one and a week two event, and there was a market increase in the amount of uh, ability to double climb, even just by the end of one event. Yeah. So and I, that's what we wanted. That's really what it's, it's such a bummer. I will say again, it's such a bummer that we didn't get to see this play, this game play out on Einstein because I think it would have been. Yeah, really exciting to I mean, literally, you would have to be breath at the end in hopes that that generator switch was level. Yeah. And that is that would have been so cool. But the world is as it is and, and such is life. And yeah. we are moved on to designing the next game. Um, but that's what we really did want to see. We wanted that third rank point to, to what's important. It's really important to us as a game design team that the third rank point is very accessible. And as you described, almost predictable once yeah. you get to a certain point in the game. Right. Uh, so this is uh, this this question is coming. Uh, this is a very important question, I think. This is from uh, <laughs> Kay Atia. Uh, they're asking, what, what will you be using? Uh, what uh, will you be using the field elements uh, for your garden this year? Oh, that's such. I should have put a qu a picture in of it. So. <laughs> The in is hopefully I remember power up wasn't that long ago, um, but the the vault tops the, so the vault in power up was made out of HDP plastic. Oh yep. And so they made perfect raised beds four feet by one foot. Oh. And so I um my wife and I had one two three four five six seven like eight raised beds made of power up pieces wow. in our yard <laughs> they're, they're so good because hdp plastic can get wet yep. it doesn't right like it doesn't leach it's all those things that you that you'd want hey re um, recycle so right this year i don't know much of the plastic on the field this year is pretty kind of flimsy so well, well maybe you could turn the generator switch into like a, a tomato hanger or something 
Yeah, yeah, I think that's probably, or lights, like grow lights, because we oh. start all our seedlings inside. Yeah, I, I have about seedlings in my house right now, so, wow. yeah. Okay. Uh, Good question. <laughs> <laughs> uh, another question here. This is from Often Back On. He's 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 going wild with these questions here. Yeah. Um, they're asking, can we expect major changes to the game structure, similar to S- Sandstorm, instead of, uh, you know, instead of like, okay, I'll, I'll rephrase this. Can we expect okay. major changes to the game structure, such as a Sandstorm instead of Auto, anytime in the future? Yeah, I think the answer to that is, can you expect anything? It's yes and no. Because we really, uh, honest to goodness, we start from scratch every year. So do we know for sure if there's going to be an auto in 2021? I cannot answer that question. One, because it's not my game. Although, I obviously, we do review the other game. Um, but we just, you know, we just, we it's on the table every season, for sure. That's not, uh, uh, match structure is not a sacred worm. Um, and, it, and it is something that we think about. I will say match time is, is is more of a sacred worm because and and this is really important to teams you want to get in the max number of plays at an event and so the longer we make matches the less number of matches you get to play right because there's only there's only a limited amount of time you can be at an event right and then the other thing that's important is that you don't want your battery to run out like four minutes in right (laughs) if we're we're gonna start playing like seven or eight minute matches you don't want your battery to be dead halfway yeah. through. So match time is much more sacred than match structure. So I will say, I think you can expect anything. So uh, to break into this a little bit, yeah. when you talked about the next year's game, mm-hmm. how much, I, I'm not asking you to tell me actually anything. How much do you mm-hmm. know about it? Are you, seek, do you not know anything about, like does the, the opposing team that's not making this year's game are they in the dark about the next year game or is it sort of like just it's there's too much to to catch up with? No, it's a little bit of the second thing. Like okay. we are in the know because we do review and shared presentations when I'm with marketing, um, the other teams also with marketing. And so, yeah, we I mean, we know of the game. I couldn't I mean, if we sat down and you said, OK, tell me all about the game, I would be like, ah, I mean, it's this. Mm. But and also because you know development happens especially this time of year development happens really quickly and so i couldn't you know even if i knew something a month ago it there's no guarantee that 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 structure is still in place so i mean yes i know of the game i i know that you know i could give you the 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 elevator pitch but i couldn't go into the nuanced details of the strategy development and the you know the you know the really the details of those of that game so so yes and no i mean we know of it but it's not we're not like experts not yet when we get down to so just to be fair and clear when we get to about september to october we all become experts in that game oh okay because it is really important for us to be involved in the um, field tour videos and the kickoff videos and the um, the manual writing is no job. You know, it's it's a lot of work from a lot of people. We're all expected to answer Q and A questions, so you got to know the game in and out if you're going to be able to answer Q and A questions. Um, so, it, once September rolls around, we, we're experts in the game. Okay, that that yeah. that that jives. Um, so, in that case, yeah. are you are you already are you, you, Jamie, are you already sort of in the next year game, the 2022 game? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's off the shelf. Wow. Sweet. Off the bench. It's ready to roll. <laughs> All right. It's uh, already rolling, I guess I should say. <laughs> and this is sooner, obviously, oh, wait, wait. than we would have before. The game's because... rolling. Is that a hint? Is that yeah. a hint? Yeah. <laughs> <No>. Game hint. <laughs> um, no, just to be clear, the community, if we're going to here, we're going to put it on the website and it's going to be called a game hint. Yes. Um, yes, yes. Where like we say stuff all the time, and then we realize, oh my god, that probably could have been um, read as a game hint once. I don't know, but then everything can. By the end of the day, when you look back, you're like, well, that one day she said this one thing. It's like, yeah, I, on that day I didn't mean it. Yeah. Um, but the uh, but yeah, so yeah, so we're actually you know this season we when again I just want to make it clear, all of us at headquarters are as disappointed in the ending of this season as our community is it's we put our heart and soul into this experience and the fact that it's cut short is challenging and disappointing to us as well so 
but we did not waste our time. You know, when we knew when the decision was made that that you know the 2020 season was suspended, um, we said let's not waste our time. We went right to work. We said, okay, got to get a game off the bench, yep. and we got to get rolling. And 20, you know, 2022 has got to get down the track. Wow. So, okay, yep. I'm, I'm looking forward to it. Yeah. Um, so uh, here's a question. This is from uh, user bmar1257. They ask. Um, how do you ensure that point values are well balanced? How do you oh, how do you figure out all that Lord. fun stuff? <laughs> we all saw Steamworks, right? <laughs> well, yes. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll be honest. We 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 do our best, but sometimes we make mistakes. You know what? It's it's. I'll be really frank. And mm. and if we look back and say, mm, if we could replay Steamworks, would we do it differently? The answer is likely yes. You know, and but when we're doing. So I will say we put a lot of time into scoring and we have our rules review, review the scoring. Okay. And so it's not just like it's willy nilly, but there are, there are like spreadsheets that are like this long and there are, and like this wide and there's like thousands of data points that like (laughs) mesh together to like create into this thing. And, you know, we compare and contrast all the game tasks not necessarily to each you know always to each other or to things that even make sense there's and then we go you know we have these um we have we we set up these like fake matches where stuff happens Mm -hmm. and we keep track of like okay so in this match we need to have some robots that only do this part of the game and this these robots just do this part of the game and who should win and who should you know it's it's intense it's a lot of work and we go through all this like data analysis, data analysis, data analysis together. All of us are in the room, the whole engineering team. And people say like, I can't get behind that. Like, it, it, I think you're not taking into account the piece. Like in this game, particularly, the control panel is too hard. It needs to be valued more. Or, you know, hanging is actually easier than we think. So we're going to value it a little less. These are the kinds of conversations that we have. So it's it's a very long process. Um, it's a lot of work. It yeah. takes a lot of folks, and we 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 really do talk through almost every situation that we can think of in a game and decide how that data looks, and then and then build an algorithm that that helps us understand how those things get together, and then you know get to point values like that. And so we really try to focus too. there's an element of this that we want to be easy too. you know, for teams, we don't want to say like, okay, we're going to have, you know, the balls be like five and two and a half. Cause that's like, awesome, <laughs> right? Yes, like, exactly. You really, we do really try to, yeah, we don't, <laughs> you know, in Steamworks, this was a really big deal. Like nine balls was, that's an, it's, it's, it's an odd number. It's also not a common number, right? Like, you nine things in a row don't look good like it's it's a it that was a really big place for us to get to in steamworks so um yeah it's a lot of work and it's just a lot of data analysis and 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 trying to make predictions on stuff that we have honestly we have no idea about because (laughs) no one's ever played this game exactly that's well that's part of the thing too is that like you know not to abstract it too much to other kinds of games right but like other games in general exist people can play them you can you can release a version of of uh you know a video game and then it's like oh my gosh this isn't working and then you can change it after the fact but right and you guys obviously first has the ability to change the rules but at the end of the day you have a responsibility to teams that built robots to not uh, you know completely obliterate a team's robot right from exactly. being able to play so you can't make major changes once it's out so it's kind of like a polish it up as best you can and push it out and hope it rolls right <laughs> yep. so and hope for the best and honestly hope our community you know accepts it and, and it, it chooses to be successful within the reins within the ranges we give them because it easily you could all of you every single person in first which is the beauty of it could look at our game and be like dude you guys should have done this yeah <laughs> and, but you can't design your robot to that you have to live within the rules that we give you. And that really is the, and be positive about it because it, you know, it, we really do our best so that you can do your best. And that, you know, we really, we really respect that. So, um, so our next question here is from uh, Jake of Troy. Uh, and mm-hmm. they are asking how much consideration is given to making a game that will play well at a lower level 
and a higher level. Like, for example, like, you know, week one versus Einstein. Yeah. And, and I will say that is a gigantic concern of ours and it is really difficult to do. Right. So you, you want to build a game. We do try to build games that grow, that have a stretch in them because you don't want to walk out week, week one and have somebody nail everything. And we've seen it before, right? Like in, some would argue that power up didn't have a stretch. Okay. That's fair. Because, you know, when you, you, well, 254 never lost a match. Yeah. Right. So a little bit, when you think about that, you know, that was a, it, that could have, when you look at our game structure, there, we may not have had enough row in that game. And so we do really, one of the challenges that we face as a team is to say, how can we make a game? that will be played extraordinarily well with teams with very little resources and extraordinarily well with teams with budgets that are very, very large. Yeah. Well, and take, and, and also so, take into account that most of the matches played are on the, the other side, that lower yes, end, right? The lower end, right? But nobody Except remembers everyone's them. watching when we get to the other end. Yes. <laughs> so you don't, even though the, the, the actual team experience, a majority experience, exactly what you described on the on the lower half, if you put it on a, you know, if you did your little normal curve, you're going to have the majority of the, well, it wouldn't be normal, I guess, then. But you're going to have the majority of your matches on the lower end. Yeah. But we need to have something that when we get to Einstein, it's still exciting to watch. Where you're still, like, gripping your hands and gripping your teeth, hoping that whatever, you know, outcome you might be cheering for happens. So I do think we, we do give a great deal to it. On top of that, which I think is another layer of this, is that we are extraordinarily committed to making sure that robots who build kitbots can be successful in our games. Oh, okay. So, for example, in Infinite Recharge, you would probably notice that the upper level of the... Um, uh, Human player station was just a little bit higher than the lowest goal. Yes. So the concept is that if you only could build the drive and you put a platform up there, you could collect the balls without doing anything. Your human player just rolls them onto you. Yep. You traverse the field really carefully <laughs> and then you drive in and stop quickly and they plop out into the low goal. Yep. So... It is a there's a great deal of consideration given to what can our kit kit bot teams do basically, um, and and it's challenging because when you look at it, you not think about those things. You think yeah. like, what could a kit bot do? I mean, I was at events where there are kit bots, so I know exactly what they can do. Um, and you know, climbing at the end was a challenge. Oh yeah, kit bot for sure, a hundred percent. But it also is where our community, which is one of the most amazing things about First Robotics Competition, is that the community swoops into these situations and helps out teams who may be struggling in some of those really challenging areas. And and that's where you want to help your neighbors say like, hey, you can't climb, but I can help you. And then I'll climb in the next 12 hours and we'll get you there, you know? And that's really the power of that gracious professionalism and cooperation that you don't get in or you don't necessarily i don't say you don't get it you don't necessarily get in other sports right in our culture at least yes yeah um okay so we got uh we, uh we're approaching the end of our time here everybody so oh, okay um we have we're going to do some a few more questions but if you've got any questions you got to send them in right now in the chat so we can make sure that we see them um this question is coming in from robert here 5291 and uh they're asking so why is the GDC shifted away from bonus RPs being extra points in playoffs, such as uh, breaching and capturing the tower in 2016 and the rotors and fuel in 2017? Yeah, such a great question. I, I love that teams th think about these things because we think about them. And sometimes when you get into like the nitty gritty of game design, you forget that the community is also kind of right along with you asking the same questions that you're asking yourself. And it's really easy for us to be like, it doesn't matter, just move on. But it does <laughs> matter. It really does matter. So we, it's it's really nice to hear these questions. So I think some of the um, some of the challenges that we face when we build these games 
is making sure that the tasks that are expected to be finished don't get overvalued when you get to the playoffs. Okay. And what I mean by that is, let's take example, for example, the control panel. If you were a, t- a team that was really good at the control panel, hopefully you've paired up with a team who was really good at shooting balls. Right. And so when it comes time to alliance selection, ideally, like this is an ideal world, which we don't live in, and I understand that. But ideally, the best control panel is going to ha- is going to be on an alliance with the best shooter. Because those two things go together really well. But does if you are good at that in, in the qualifications and you get your rank points for it, when you get to the playoffs, is this is a question we have to ask ourselves, is it necessary to overvalue that task? Because those tasks already have points associated with them. Okay. Right. So I'm not saying that we always get it right because we don't. But one of the things that we ask ourselves to get to that question, and I don't know that it's safe to say that we have moved away from it. I think it's more accurate that we have. This is part of that scoring analysis I was telling you about is that this is part of the scoring analysis. The question every year is, do we need to put points on this in the playoffs? So it's not like we just like threw that out the door and said, we're not doing that anymore. It's more that we try to evaluate the scores and balance them correctly so that what's incentivized in qualifications is not either over or under incentivized when you get to playoffs. I see. Because that balance is really important. Because what you don't want to happen is a robot, if it's over incentivized in qualifications, that means that a robot that may not deserve is not the right word but may not have earned their place at the top of the um alliance selection to then go into playoffs and not be successful because okay. that's a really negative feeling for that team yeah if they go into playoffs and then they're like what the heck now i can't win any matches <laughs> so you just want to be we we're always looking for that balance between what is incentivized when and how can we find the right space for it? So I definitely want to make make it clear that we consider that every year. If we did not just like it's not it's not because we don't think it's valuable. It's because we felt like with the scoring we made this year, we didn't need it. Okay. And right. I just realized that it's gotten dark out, so now I just look like a ghost with a face. <laughs> so, oh well. No, it's okay. You, it, it it looks fine over here and. I, okay, good. I, I trust me. I I started streaming at two o'clock, and suddenly I noticed the sun was gone. <laughs> if you saw me looking over my shoulder, um, uh, a couple more questions here. This one's coming from uh, Nutty Man Fifty Four, uh, and they are asking, uh, or I guess he's asking, how often do you have a promising concept for a game that everyone loves, but turns out to be infeasible from a field design perspective? Um, I will say, I, I would say that happens. Um, I say relatively off often. Um, we do, there are designs out there. I mean, there are designs that I've had in my head and I've drawn out and I, every year I'm like, this got to get on the bench. Yeah. This would be such a great game. And then I talk to my mechanical group and they're like, dude, we can't build that. Like, come on. <laughs> yeah. So I do think that it, it, it happens relatively often in terms of conceptual ideas, but for games to get on the bench, to be selected, one of the criteria that it takes to get to the bench is, can we build this? can we do this? That's actually part of the bench making process is to say, is this feasible? Is it reality? Could teams even build these robots? Right? Like, cause that's a big part of this. Like, Oh, we made this great game, but nobody can build a robot to do it. Right. And so that's, so it, it by the time it gets to the bench, it's already, that ship has sailed. Right? Okay. Like it's going to happen, but definitely conceptual wise. And when we're brainstorming, like a, a, a good number of our ideas that that we think would be amazing do get uh, asked nicely to not be on the bench because <laughs> they really can't. It really can't happen. <laughs> That's a good way to put it. Okay, a um, couple more coming in here. We've got this one yep. here is by uh, user uh, Boredom. Be thy name. Interesting. Oh. They ask if you could retroactively make any change to a previous game. What would it be? And I guess I'll just limit it. I don't want you to go the whole first story, history, but maybe just oh, good because I would be in trouble. Maybe just <laughs> how about just one of, some of the games you've worked on during your time at first to narrow it down. Sure, a little bit. sure. 
Wow. I guess I, I can think of two off the top of my head, but I want to be clear that I'm speaking for myself and not for the game design team right. because my ideas do tend to be kind of off the deep end sometimes <laughs> and I they have to get reeled in because they're not reality. Okay. But I would say that I think that um so I I will be clear when I'm when I'm out in the field until 2020, when I'm in the field and I ask teams what's your favorite game, the majority of the answer I get is Steamworks. Really? Yes, which okay. surprises people because a lot of people think that that game was not that good, but our community loved it. Um, it, it looked super cool. You yeah. couldn't you couldn't deny that. You couldn't deny it. And and just the game pieces were so those gears were so oh, yeah. fun. Yeah. They were they just were were great and just the fact, I mean, the human players being on the field had a lot. Yeah. Um if I that's one game that I think we we that if I could go back in time and really if I somehow had the vision of that we would have known that fuel would have not been as valuable as it was, I would have changed the fuel value to be two to one instead of three to one. Okay. Because I think that had we done that, um, some of our fuel, I think two things would have happened kind of off the top and lots of other things would have happened eventually. But off the top, I think we would have seen a lot more fuel robots because that if you had done two to one instead of three to one, we, the, um, RP of the 40 KPA would have been more easily accessible. Yeah. And because the rotor KPA, uh, rotor RP was actually quite difficult to get. You ha you definitely had to have your, you know, your robots in, in a really like tight uh, schedule to get that, that RP. And I would have liked to see the shooting RP uh, get, you know, kind of be the easy one of the group. So for me, I would have changed the value of the fuel. And then the second one off the top of my head that I would have changed is um, is I would have, in Recycle Rush, I, I think there were elements of that game that were, like, completely brilliant. But it would have been, I would have get, like, the, the trash cans in the center or whatever they were called, the recycling bins in the center, yeah. really left, as a, t speaking from my, I didn't work at first at the time, from my team experience, it just left this weird taste in our mouths. Like, was the match over in the first 20 seconds? You know, lots of people said that, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. But I just, I think that there was a missed opportunity there that I, I certainly would have liked to, to revisit that just somehow either, you know, have more out there or, you know, whatever the answer was. I think there are a lot of different, those are, those are the two that I think off the top of my head that, that I would change if we could replay a game. Cool. I, I, and, you know, I think, I think that's probably, that's probably, lines up with what I would probably say for the last few years too. Like the, 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 the oh, good. once the one thing that like, <laughs> that uh, is like the most kind of glaring, like oops, I guess would say in the game, you could say that maybe like some games are better than others, but something that's yeah, easy yeah. to like literally changing a number and some code to make it work. Right. So, mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. all right, we got, uh, we're going to do like two more questions here. Okay. Uh, this one's from nutty man 54. He asks again, um, what kind of postseason lessons learned process do you, does the GC have to uh, avoid, repeating issues or problems that they found during the previous year's game? Yeah, actually a lot. That's a great question. We do spend a significant amount of time talking about the games that we create and how what went wrong, what we need to reevaluate, and how kind of the processes of how we get there. And I, I'll be clear that oftentimes it's necessarily like, oh, uh, like, for example, in Steamworks, we should have fixed the numbers. Like, because a lot of that is like, well, there's not a lot. I mean, there's not a lot we can change about that particular. So, some things just need to be left in the past, let's say. Yes. Um, but we do take a significant amount of time to talk about actual mechanical lessons learned. So, for example, Steamworks was a nice game. There were lots of mechanical lessons we learned in that game. Um, one of them was about counting the fuel on the way out, because if you remember at all, there was this elaborate thing where like there had to be carpet on the side because the light, the, the counters were actually like picking up weird lights in the arenas oh, and wow. like all this other bizarre thing. And so it, when we talk about um, lessons learned, it's more along the lines of actual engineering processes than it is the, you know, sort of the, you know, I'd say like the game mechanics because many of the game mechanics, once they're played, we sort of put them aside, but a lot of these engineering processes do try to learn from and make better decisions in the future. Um, a very similar reason in, um, you know, in power up a, a lot of people, I'm sure you all know this, but a lot of the welding in power up on 
plates was not really that great. Mm. And it caused a lot of problems in getting those, getting the switches and the, um, whatever it was called, the thing scale. in the middle. The scale balance. And so, you know, that was something that we took away from and said, you know, if we're going to build this kind of, uh, kind of a lab, more, I'll say more elaborate mechanical process, is there some better engineering we that maybe would be, uh, that would, that would result in a, in a more positive experience. And I will say we brought that into the generator switch a lot because we knew that that generator switch couldn't, needed to be level when no one was on. Yeah, and so that drove a lot of the engineering design to that that we did learn from Power Up. So a lot of and and also just like inner workings, we talk about more like how can we be more efficient with our own time? How can we be more more efficient with our volunteer time? How can we be more efficient in our you know in just in meeting processes and note taking and kind of that documentation process? So we do quite a lot of um, reflection and relationship development and 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 lesson learned there but like i said not so much in like oh well in seamworks we should have done this or whatever okay cool all right so this will be our our last question here okay and i'll give you a pass if you don't want to answer this one um <laughs> this question's from um let's see uh this is oh it's uh, frank merrick seven and they ask oh, uh, what's the hardest part of your job oh of like my whole job? Well, I'll let you answer well, it however you want. that I know that it's Frank Merrick 7, I won't bring up the hardest part of my job. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, I think that the, I guess, so I was, full disclosure, I'm pretty emotional. I do take um, comments that get made about FIRST and about FRC. I take them very personally. I know I shouldn't, but I still do because I, I'm just very connected to the community and I'm very passionate about it. And I think for me, the hardest part of the job is when people make disparaging comments about the work that we do without taking the time to understand who we are and what we do as just as human beings, I guess. Yeah. Because I, even me personally, you know, people have sent me emails that aren't so pleasant. And it, it's sometimes people use our processes like the Q&A or posting on Facebook or you know, re retweeting something and, and the comments are posting on chief Delphi and the comments aren't so positive. And I think that sometimes I, and I know those, and I can understand that it's frustrating to be part of this program, but it's very, it's just very difficult to have those kinds of public comments without taking the time to just think for like one more second that these people are human beings and they are like, we really work our tails off for these, for our jobs. And it's, it's just difficult to hear those comments or be in those experiences where I don't feel like people have given us the benefit of the doubt that, that we're really trying and that we, we never sit around and say like, Oh, let's see what we can do this time. You know? <laughs> we got them. Yeah, like it's always positive and we're always trying to do the best. And so yeah. I think that's probably the hardest part of my job. Frank Merrick Seven. Yeah, whoever you may be. I, I, I'll i say this as um, someone who's who is certainly not part of, not doesn't does, is not a first person in that respect. But I've hung out with you all doing various video things over the years and gotten to know yeah, a number yeah. of you um, that I I can totally concur with everything that Jamie said that um all you all work so hard and care so much about this program that I'm I'm extremely happy that uh, you all are are the stewards of it truthfully and and honestly oh, and, and part of that is that like over the last we'll say like six to eight maybe ten years or so um, first has done a lot to sort of part the veil to a certain extent to sort of show that side of things I remember when I was a student and a young mentor that first was very much like a a brick wall in front of it. You couldn't really, you yeah. had no idea what was going on in that building. And um, through stuff like this, or even just doing field tour videos with actual real people, um, it puts a, a more personal face on it that hopefully more people will get to to fully understand and realize it's not some sort of corporate conglomerate despite uh, being a, a relatively large company for, for what you guys do, so. Yeah, yeah, so. yeah. And I will say everybody that works at first Everybody that works at first, especially everybody in FRC, because that's who I interact with, is very passionate about oh, yeah. what we do. We would not have this job 
if we didn't care deeply about the experience of our teams, about the experience of our sponsors, about the experience of our volunteers and yeah. our mentors. And, and, you know, Frank, I know Frank Merrick seven might disagree, but Frank as a director is a very kind hearted human being. And he is, um, you know, he takes the team experience very much personally. And so if you're ever sitting out there, you know, those folks who might have the opportunity to be upset or be negative and, and I, it's going to happen to all of us. It happens to me sometimes. Yep. Like just encourage you to take the one more second and remember that we're all people who are really doing everything we can to make your experience positive. And, and this season has been just unbelievable on our community, Yeah, you know, just unbelievable. And, and, and it, and we, we take that very much to heart. So, you know, we're, and if you ever have a question, send an email because Frank answers them. Yeah. Yeah. I've, I've seen that happen before. Uh, many years ago, a friend of mine, uh, guessed that his email would be what it was based on his first and last name and uh, yep. got a response and it was, it was great. Yeah. Um, so he, I get, he answers his email. So I'll, I'll end uh, in that, in this respect, I'll end it on this more positive one. This is from uh, Karthik 1114. <laughs> oh, um, he, hey Karthik. <laughs> he'll be presenting on Friday, by the way. So make sure you guys tune in. Yeah. Um, yeah. And Saturday. I can't wait for yeah. that build. To, uh, oh. Francis. I can't tell you when I saw that lineup, I was like, dang, I am, <laughs> going to be on the edge of my seat. I can't wait to hear what those folks have to say. Well, about very it. cool. I'm looking forward to yeah. it too. Uh, but, but Karthik says he doesn't actually have a question, uh, but I oh. wanted, he just wants to say that he very, I very much appreciate uh, that your staff takes game design, a, makes game design a priority as opposed to a side job or an afterthought and ensures that the focus stays on what's important to your customers, the teams. Absolutely. And, and game design is, it's, it's all, not all. Cause we, obviously all have other responsibilities yeah. but it is it is on our minds every second cool all right well yep. jamie thank you so much for joining us this was sure. a lot of fun i think yeah. you, you you were did a fantastic job and answered a lot of great oh, questions you. from the community and also thank you to all the community for watching for doing yeah. a great job and asking some thanks for the questions my goodness they're so good yeah <laughs> i look forward to meeting every single one of you if i'm ever at a find me say hey i'm whoever do whatever. And, and I just think that, you know, I, I want to meet all of you. I think that you're amazing. So. Yeah. All right. Well, Jamie, thank you so much again. Before I go, I want to just make a quick yeah. plug tomorrow. We're going to be uh, back again tomorrow with day three of the conferences. We've got lots of great uh, stuff coming up for that. It should be a lot of fun, including the very first presentation at 2 p.m. Eastern. We're going to have uh, Candy Desjardins. She is the lead judge advisor for New England First. Her and some other judges are going to be coming on, and we're going to have a discussion about what the judges look for when it comes to uh, awards, what their thoughts on it, and what the what awards process is kind of like. Um, nice. Yeah. So I'm, I'm looking forward to that one and all the rest of them, not only tomorrow, but also Thursday, Friday. Wait, today's Wednesday. Thursday, yep. Friday, Saturday, Friday and Saturday. <laughs> I've been sitting in front of a computer yeah. for a long time, so it gets lost on me. But <laughs> with that, everybody... I hope you have a wonderful evening and uh, I hope to look forward and see many of you uh, tomorrow. Bye-bye for now. Bye. And we're